Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us again today. Welcome back um, to the second day of our Critical Access Hospital Virtual Conference, Region A. Um, we're very happy to have everyone joining us today. This presentation is being recorded, um, just a heads up. And we'll give people um, another minute or so to come in. Um, and then we will get started with um, the first presentation by Brian Hoppola, who is the president of Stroudwater Capital Partners. All right, so Brian, whenever you're ready, go ahead and get started. Thanks, Hillary. I'm really excited to be joining everybody this morning. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So my name, as you said, Hillary, is Brian Hoppola, um, and I am the CEO of Stroudwater Capital Partners, but really have been with Stroudwater uh, since 1998 and worked with Eric Schell to we launched the rural healthcare practice at Stroudwater back at that time. So here we are 26 years later, I guess it is, um, still working on many of the same issues that we started working on then shortly after the critical access hospital program started. So uh, Hillary, you kind of started to address some of the housekeeping items, but we wanted to make sure that we shared this information with everybody just in terms of you know, making it clear that the slides and recordings will be available following the webinar. Um, as you indicated, everything is being recorded. Uh, people will be muted um, automatically, and we will have some time for questions throughout the day. Um, so please uh, use the chat and Q&A feature in Zoom here to ask a question, and we will make sure to prioritize getting some uh, responses to that. And then very importantly to us, um, as we've been doing this now the last number of years, uh, having uh, your feedback on the survey following the session will be really, really important so that we can continue to improve and hone in on uh, the right content to help you um, in your communities and in your organizations. So Stroudwater Associates, uh, as I mentioned, you know, really has a long history of serving rural providers uh, really a national practice. You can see here the map of cl clients just over the last couple of years um, since 2017, um, a lot of different rural settings and uh, very active really across the country. So we're very happy to also have Stroudwater Capital Partners, uh, which is the organization that I lead. We are a subsidiary of Stroudwater Associates, really focused um, on securing financing for uh, rural communities and rural hospitals to uh, improve their infrastructure. And that's going to be what I'm going to be presenting on largely today is how to think about that relative to some of the trends that have happened in the marketplace, um, particularly in interest rates and some of the other factors that are really drivers for acquiring capital to um, improve existing facilities, replace facilities, whatever the right solution is for your community. Um, Stroudwater, many of you know, provides a you know, really comprehensive set of services, uh, both in terms of strategy and operations, really runs the gamut from A to Z in terms of being able to support communities, <clears throat> excuse me, with strategic planning, with assistance in uh, partnership strategies, um, population health. Uh, many of us on the call have uh, really sat through and, and learned from Eric Schell with his shaky bridge presentation to help us understand the context for the markets are heading around population health, uh, a substantial uh, part of the practice in terms of supporting organizations with their 
uh, physician hospital alignment strategies, uh, physician compensation survey that Stroudwater Associates has started really you know, helps continue to inform the marketplace around what the best practices are and what the current levels of compensation are uh, for physicians and providers in rural America. Uh, and then you know, really a lot of operational focus um, Today, uh, following my presentation, Amy Graham, who is the practice leader for our revenue cycle solutions, will be presenting on uh, chronic care management. And so there's lots of operational uh, pieces as well. We have a really substantial clinical practice to help with uh, care management, uh, post-acute care strategies and operations, payer contracting. Wade spoke yesterday about cost reports. So really kind of a, a strong balance of both strategic and operational and clinical and financial expertise within Stradmar. So with that context, we're gonna jump right into today's first presentation, which will be uh, my presentation to start to talk about uh, some of the challenges that we have in terms of securing capital, uh, particularly with higher interest rates from 2023. Uh, this presentation really was born out of a lot of what was happening last year in the marketplace in 2023 when uh, there were a couple of bank closures a little over a year ago, uh, March of 2023, which kind of sent for some ripple effects through the market with interest rates start to climb higher. They did that through pretty much the course of March through the end of 2023. And frankly, we wanted to help under help people understand what's the impact of those interest rate changes on the project's viability? We were supporting uh, a dozen or so different critical access hospitals with their capital planning and strategies uh, using the USDA Community Facilities Program. And they were asking some good questions around, you know, are these rates going to make our projects no longer affordable and unsustainable? And so we needed to do some analysis and thinking about that. and. The presentation today has really been born out of that, those lessons. Before we get too far into the uh, session today, though, Hillary, I was wondering if you could please open up the poll. I'd really like to understand the kind of beginning basis or level of expertise that people have on the call today in terms of prior capital projects. Uh, how many capital projects have you completed in the past? And uh, if you could just uh, take a moment to answer that poll question, that would be really appreciated. Okay. So the poll is open. Just take a few minutes to enter the poll and thank you for participating. Right. So if you have not yet made your selection, if you could just take a moment to do so, I think we're kind of climbing up to about three quarters of the participants having responded, which seems like a good, good basis here. So it, last chance. So we're going to close the poll here in just a moment. Let's go ahead and shut that down. All right. Ready? Yeah, I think we're ready. All so right. from the results perspective, can can you see the results on the screen, Hillary? Yes. Great. Perfect. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, in today's uh, meeting, we have kind of a, a split group. Uh, it does not surprise me that the majority of the, of the participants on today's call, almost half, have not done a capital project. I mean, that is very much what we see in critical access hospitals and really dovetails with a lot of what I'm going to share today as it relates to the history of of the critical access hospital program and capital investment in rural.
Brian. Brian, we've lost your audio. All right, just a minute. So let's just give Brian a second to see if we can get Brian's audio back. Brian, can you hear me? All right, so we aren't able to hear you. All right, how does that work? There you is go. That, yep, you're back. Thank you. Able to get back. All right, perfect. Thanks. Yeah, so what I was sharing was, um, you know, in terms of our poll for today, uh, the majority of the people on the call have not had experience in capital projects. That is very common to what we typically see. Um, I am impressed that there are at least a quarter of the folks on the call today that have done three or more projects. Um, they maybe could be doing this presentation today based on that amount of experience, but each one of these projects I'm sure is very different and very much a learning experience. So we are excited to have you all on the call today and thanks for sharing uh, that uh, information. So I am moving things around on my computer now so I can see things. Uh, so you know, to really start out the context setting for capital investment, it really makes sense to go back to the genesis of capital investment in many of our rural community um, infrastructure, uh, you know, our, our delivery systems um, for rural healthcare. Uh, going back to the Hill Burton program in the mid 40s, which was really set up with the purpose of constructing and expanding healthcare facilities and expanding access. Uh, you can see here in terms of some of the facts that there are just a you know overwhelming number of facilities that were constructed during this period of time, uh, 8,000 facilities, a 35% increase in accessibility for underserved areas. You know, that really is the legacy of the program and the impact. Um, a 20% decrease in overall mortality rates from this program, a million jobs in the healthcare sector created as a result of this investment. So these are legacy um, issues and really things that we continue to see uh, as it relates to much, uh, many of you are probably still operating in Hilburton uh, facilities themselves. Um, so there is, you know, really important aspect to this program that continues to, to this day. Now, the I think the important thing to really understand is, you know, how, how have things developed over time? So we had the Hilburton program in the late 40s, uh, you know, really got things rolling in our rural communities around providing health care to create some of those really impressive outcomes of improved access. And then in the early 80s, uh, you know, starting with DRGs, the prospective payment system came into effect. Uh, no secret that the research has, you know, very strongly shown that under those payment systems, rural providers we're using every penny of that payment to, um, you know, to kind of make ends meet and meet operational needs. Those payment systems um, included capital payments, but really those capital, the payments overall were insufficient for rural providers to be reinvesting capital um, over time. And then, you know, getting into outpatient prospective payment in the later 80s. Uh, there really just was not a resource base for many of, of, of you in the communities to be able to continue to, you know, invest in the infrastructure, to update the infrastructure, um, certainly in comparison to our, our competing and um, larger urban and suburban providers. So then we had the critical access hospital program, you know, starting in the Balanced Budget Act of 1997 that created cost-based payment really effectively started to stabilize the financial deterioration that had been happening over the last 20 years prior to that and provided cost-based reimbursement, which of course includes the reimbursement of capital-related costs, um, interest and depreciation primarily. Um, and then we saw also the federal government kind of step in with some additional programs um, Initially, through the HUD program, Housing and Urban Development has a hospital mortgage program uh, that they were making accessible to critical access hospitals in the early 2000s to really help enhance the access to the markets, to overcome some of the markets' bias towards bigger is better 
and um, you know, rural is more risky and therefore more costly to finance. So it kind of created that, you know, that downward spiral of we didn't have uh, sufficient resources. The market, you know, recognized that, and then the costs associated with borrowing were higher, uh, which kind of led to a lot of underinvestment, you know, over this period of time um, in in most rural communities, and kind of leads us to where we are today, which is having a lot of infrastructure, which is desperately in need of updating. You know, been in organizations where. You know, literally the CEO had to take a break from a meeting and go out and you know, service and, and provide some support to a, an, an air handling system, an AC unit, um, you know, electrical fires in organizations as new equipment is brought on board and that 1940s vintage electrical system was not built for those types of loads so that there's a lot of additional, you know, risk associated with that um, type of development and you know, really just understanding that we haven't been able to modernize rural healthcare to the extent that we need to, to be able to handle the shift, for example, from predominantly inpatient care back in the 40s to now predominantly outpatient care um, in today's um, healthcare market. When we look at the primary sources of capital, uh, we have that, you know, the kind of government programs. Um, I mentioned the HUD program initially, more recently, really over the last decade or so, that has really been substituted with USDA's Community Facilities Program. Uh, their budget has increased substantially, uh, it has grown from about $300 million a little over a decade ago to a little over $3.2 billion um, in today's world. Um, they make a substantial number of those uh, community facility investments in healthcare related projects. So about half of their portfolio uh, is in healthcare. They're really strongly, they're by far the largest uh, funder of, of rural healthcare projects in the country. Uh, the direct loan rate, so when you get a loan from USDA itself, uh, it's a very low interest rate, it is 3.5%. And more recently, really within the last uh, year or maybe two years, they have developed a technical assistance program in collaboration with the National Rural Health Association um, to really make sure that people um, in the field, uh, like you on the call today, have uh, support in understanding how to approach the, the uh, program, how to be successful under the program, how to get yourself ready for um, you know, securing capital, um, how to continue to be successful once that capital has been secured. So it's a pretty broad an impactful technical assistance program. And Brock Slaybaugh and Tommy Barnhart at the National Rural Health Association are great advocates for making sure that those dollars get out into the communities, uh, your communities, to support your capital planning and success over the long term. Uh, more recently, there is also a, a new, what's called a new markets tax credit program. This is run through the Department of Treasury and some lenders that are called uh, Community Development Finance Institutions or CDFIs. Um, they really try to direct capital into areas of need. Uh, they have about three and a half billion dollars themselves in this program. Um, now that's for, the, that's for the entire country covering urban and rural needs. So about 20% of that gets invested in rural communities in any given year. Um, still you know, substantial amount of money that'd be 700,000 or $700 million annually, if my math is correct. Uh, the capital allocation is competitive and really the competition is based on the impact of the project itself. Um, the, the, the number of jobs that are being created, the economic impact in the community. Um, we certainly know that rural healthcare providers are a cornerstone to that economic development um, that happens um, regularly. And there's a seven year period um, that uh, recipients of these dollars are required to report back um, the impact of what they're being created. And uh, one of the you know, really key features of this particular source of capital that I didn't address is that the dollars that come into the organization do not need to be repaid. Um, it's a somewhat complicated structure, maybe even say a very complicated structure, but Really, at the end of the day, what happens is the money 
the people who put money into this program are getting the return on that investment through tax credits. That's why it's called the New Markets Tax Credit Program. So they're not expecting that these dollars are repaid. They're getting um, you know, tax credits through this seven-year period that more than offset what they you know, want to get from a return on their investment. We also, it's worth noting, have you know the traditional source of capital to urban and suburban healthcare providers, which are tax-exempt bonds. Um, you know, kind of Wall Street oriented products. Um, these are sold to individuals or institutional investors like, um, you know, pension funds, et cetera. Um, they may be backed by taxes, but they don't have to be. So they can be based on a revenue pledge of the organization. Um, typically, because of the bias that I mentioned previously, these are considered what are often called non-rated or junk bonds. So that carries a higher interest rate and that really reflects the bias that Wall Street has against smaller providers. And that is one of the reasons that we've not been able to access capital at the same rates that urban and suburban um, healthcare systems have because of that bias against small rural being too risky, therefore you know, having to increase the cost of the capital from their perspective to offset that risk. Now that can change um, if the project has a, a credit enhancement, either through uh, an affiliation with a larger healthcare system, or there is a tax basis in the community that is dedicated to support the repayment of those bonds. So there are some ways to offset that, that um, the bond folks will, will, will definitely talk about. But primarily for today's conversation, we're gonna focus on the USDA Community Facilities Program, because that is where most of the projects that we see get financed. Now, when we start to assess the feasibility of a capital investment, it's important to start with an understanding of what variables are really gonna be driving uh, our ability to make that investment and make sure that it's a sustainable investment, that we're not putting the organization's financial condition um, at risk. And you can see here that the, the major levers, so to speak, are interest rate, the total amount of debt that the project is, is taking on uh, for a critical access hospital, the payer mix, you know, the cost-based payer mix more specifically. And then what the uh, cash, the kind of year-end cash flow, EBITDA cash flow looks like. So those are the variables that we want to be able to understand. And what we really need to understand even at a deeper level than that is how important are each of these factors? Are they all equally important or are some more important for us to be mindful of in managing more actively than others? The way that we go about answering that question is through the sensitivity analysis and to kind of brush off your economics understanding if something is highly sensitive, then you see kind of a steep relationship between variables. Um, if something's kind of a low impact, not as important to consider, you've got kind of a flatter relationship or a flatter line. So we're gonna go through an analysis that tests each one of these different variables and tries to help us understand the relative importance between each of them to the success of our project and to our ability to secure financing. Before I do that though, I think it's really important that we're all on the same page with some of the trends that we have been seeing in healthcare construction uh, within the last number of years. So starting with construction cost trends, this is information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the, the Fed, um, tracks this information, and it's what's called the producer price index. So this is kind of the underlying price of a healthcare construction project. This data starts in 2012 and trends forward to 2024. Um, but in order to really understand the trends, we wanted to break this out even a little bit more granularly. So you can see here from 2012 to 2021, we had a period where we had on average about 2.1% 2, 2 average annual growth. 
So, you know, some years starting at about 2017, you can see a kind of uptick to be a little bit more steep. Um, but if you average it out over this entire period of time, it was 2.1% per year. And that becomes kind of a planning assumption for our capital projects. So, you know, we can look at the cost, the underlying cost of the construction and have an escalation factor associated with how much we think that underlying cost is going to change from year to year as we're either you know securing additional resources or going through a financing application process. Now, the really interesting thing that happened um, in starting in 2021 was we had a period of really substantial inflation. So between 2021 and 2022, that 2.1% average annual change increased to a 17% average annual change. I mean, we were supporting projects at this time and it was almost like as soon as the budget was solidified, it was out of date because costs were increasing so fast and so substantially uh, through that period of time. And really interestingly, this is not stuff that really made the news. So it was only the people who were actively planning projects that were kind of seeing these cost increases. Um, Gratefully, in 2023, we saw some moderation of that growth, and we ended up having a 1.4% decline in 23 to the underlying cost trend uh, for building projects in healthcare. Um, but you know, it's important to note that even with a small moderation, it kind of has taken the pressure off, but those costs are still substantially higher than they were you know, at the beginning of the pandemic and even more substantially higher than they were you know, a little over 10 years ago. So the premium associated with um, you know, the cost of construction has increased substantially. And you might also say that the cost of delay then has also increased quite substantially. So the status quo really does not exist in this particular way because the costs are you know, substantially higher than they've been in the past in that only raises the bar that much further for being able to make capital investments to expand services, meet community needs, you know, really produce um, and, and and create a lot more efficiency in our organization. All the things that are expected and that we've seen as positive outcomes from capital investments in rural healthcare projects. Now, interestingly, on the interest rate side, um, there are some you know, trends that I also referenced where we've seen. This now goes back to 2007, um, and there are two lines here. So the yellow line are the rates for financing on a shorter term, a two-year construction loan, for example. Um, in the USDA program, that is a separate piece of finance. So we want to reflect that data separately. Um, and then you can see the dark teal line here is the typical rate for a 30-year permanent loan. Um, under USDA's programs, um, you know, generally declining from 2007 to 2020. And then at the start of the pandemic, those rates were starting to come up. And uh, you also saw short-term rates really spike. And short-term rates and long-term rates are really close to each other in today's market. And there's a lot of you know, market dynamics, which which in, in broader economic, macroeconomic issues, which address and really drive a lot of these issues. But for a uh, USDA guaranteed loan in today's marketplace, that is you know, somewhere in the seven and a half to eight and a half percent range. Um, and the construction loan for just that two year piece often that you need to complete the project is Kind of close to the same amount uh, in terms of interest costs in today's market. So wanted to kind of have us all on the same page with that context of what's been going on in the marketplace and then start to jump into this analysis. So the analysis really starts with what if we had a $20 million project and our interest rate, you know, these variables that we're going to be tweaking, our interest rate was 4.5%. Um, so we have a 30 year term, uh, just a little over $1.2 million a year in debt service um, payments. And that breaks out into, you know, 
$328,000 of principal in the first year, $900,000 of interest expense. So that's kind of the base case of what we're going to test as it relates to um, our ability to repay a loan like that. And for the purposes of illustration, we're going to assume that the organization has a million dollars of EBITDA. So we have a $567,000 operating profit change in net assets. Um, on this hypothetical example, we have $433,000 of existing depreciation and interest that we add back in. So our earnings before depreciation and interest is a million dollars. That's just a, our beginning base case. Now, that's one source of repayment for uh, this loan. But we also, as a critical access hospital, get our reimbursement on interest and depreciation, you know, project-related capital costs. And for the purpose of this analysis, we're going to assume that's 45%. So we've got our a million dollars and and six one million six thousand dollars in new project depreciation that we're adding to the books. That nine hundred thousand dollars of additional interest, so about one point nine million dollars in new project costs, at a forty five percent reimbursement payer mix would be an extra eight hundred fifty eight thousand dollars. So in total, we take our million dollars of EBITDA, our eight hundred fifty eight thousand dollars of project cost reimbursement. We've got you know, just under $1.9 million of funds available to service long-term debt. And, and funders and lenders really like to see that expressed as a, as a ratio. It's called the debt service coverage ratio because it really takes the amount of money that's available and compares it to the money that's going to be going out on an annual basis for the loans itself. So in this case, the $1.858 million and the 1.228 million in, in debt service payments results in a 1.51 debt service coverage ratio, which really the easiest way to think about that is for every dollar of debt that we have, we're generating an extra 51 cents of excess cash flow for all of our other operational needs. Um, you know, routine capital, you know, continuing um, to invest in ongoing capital and supplies, et cetera. Um, that is what the extra cushion relates to there. And now in the remaining uh, 10 minutes here or so, I'm going to go through each of the different scenarios that we tested in terms of understanding how important is this particular variable to the overall um, success of the project. Um, and what we start with here is just so everybody is on the same page, kind of looking at changing one variable at a time. So under our base case scenario, we have a million dollars in cash flow. The question that we want to ask is, what if that cash flow decreases by 10%? What does that do to the debt service coverage ratio, which is really that primary indicator for our ability to afford a loan? And you can see that as our EBITDA, our cash flow goes down, our debt service coverage ratio goes down. Seems like that makes a lot of sense. Um, you can see the kind of difference between critical access hospital debt service coverage metrics versus if the cost based reimbursement did not exist. So we recognize, you know, that part of our reimbursement system is really, really important to our ability to secure capital because that's what generates this this gap here. And then. Uh, we can kind of look at the USDA debt service coverage ratio threshold, which is uh, around 1.2 to 1.25. And that's what's in this pale yellow color here. So by looking at this type of analysis, what this is really say saying is if we have a million dollars of free cash flow EBITDA and those other assumptions, we're going to be well above the required thresholds. And if some things change and our, our financial performance deteriorates, it can kind of slide down to about that $656,000 mark before we get into, you know, dipping below the USDA required thresholds to be successful. So we know that it just makes intuitive sense that cash flow is going to be a main driver of our ability to, to support a loan um, over the long term. And that it's a you know it's a fairly sensitive variable here that as our cash 
deteriorates, so does our ability to support long-term debt. I'm going to go through the rest of these a little quicker because you know they're all set up the same way. Um, they all start on the far left hand here with our base case scenario and then change things by a 10% increment um, to really assess how that impacts the coverage ratios. Um, in the case of the total amount of debt, um, we're going to be increasing the amount of debt to really understand with the cash flow that's being generated, how much debt could we ultimately support? So if we had that million dollars, that's not going to vary in this particular analysis. But what we are going to vary is how much we're borrowing. And what this is effectively saying is that that million dollars of borrowing can support about $29.3 million in debt and still stay above some of the thresholds. So payer mix, we get a lot of questions on as critical access hospitals. Um, you know, it is uh, important to, to track. And in this case, we're going to start with that 45% payer mix and then decrease it down um, incrementally. And what we can see here is that if we had a 45% uh, payer mix, cost-based payer mix, we're going to be, again, you know, well above the thresholds. And that can decline to somewhere right around where we hit the 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 mark here, which is about probably twenty eight percent cost based reimbursement. Um, now, there's really not a lot of reasons that we would see a decline in cost based payer mix um, from a project, but you know, again, it's an important variable to at least assess the importance of as it relates to our ability to support a project and have that project be sustainable. So the last uh, variable that we tested here was is the interest rates, and this one was kind of a surprise, frankly, um, in terms of of where it tested out. Because you can see we start with an interest rate of that four and a half percent, and go all the way up to an interest rate of eight percent, and we're right at the threshold, even at the outside of of our scenario analysis here, but. You know, around a seven and a half percent interest rate with the other variables staying the same would still support um, the project and allow it to be successful going forward. If you haven't been able to kind of follow along, um, you know, this particular chart really just takes everything that we've talked about to this point and puts it on the same chart. And what you can see here is you know, everything is declining as the variables are changing, but they're declining at different rates. And the different rates are really indicating the different levels of importance or sensitivity as it relates to our planning efforts. Um, interestingly, that uh, interest rate analysis that we just did at the, at the last one is what we would call the least important or least sensitive variable out of all of these things to be to be mindful of and considering. And you can kind of see that because it is the flattest of the of the analyses here, followed by payer mix, followed by the total amount of debt. And then the most important uh, variable here, which kind of creates the biggest impact with the changes over time or potential changes in different scenarios is the amount of cash flow or EBITDA uh, that we're assuming to be in support of the project. So from least to most important, it is interest rate, payer mix, debt, total debt, and cash flow. So in terms of some things that I hope that you can absolutely take away from my opening comments uh, today in our virtual conference here is that while interest rates get a lot of attention, they get a lot of press, we heard all about uh, what was happening in the financial markets in 2023. We, you know, the Fed raised interest rates regularly to try to tamp down some of that inflation that we were seeing. Um, lots of speculation as to whether they will start to see in this current year some Fed rate cuts. And I have not seen any kind of consensus overall that indicates one particular path or the other for what the Fed is going to do this upcoming year. But Bottom line is interest rates get a lot of attention and rightfully so potentially create a lot of concern with critical access hospital leaders 
that are you know, considering or in the middle of a capital planning project and don't want that project to be threatened by higher interest rates. Good news is they're really not. The, the other side of that story, though, is going back to that data that I shared around the increases in construction costs, which is that is a huge factor. Um, as I mentioned, those costs started to moderate in 2023, but they're still substantially higher and likely to continue to creep up on a going forward basis. So the cost of delay is substantial um, from an escalation perspective. And the dollars per square foot to do any kind of project, whether that's renovation, expansion, or a replacement of the facility completely, um, are really substantially higher um, year after year. Um, so the cost of inaction um, increases in that way. We recommend a couple very specific next steps, which is starting with you know, thinking about our facility strategy as part of our long-term organizational strategy and, under, and having as part of our strategic plan um, you know, the areas that we're going to prioritize for facility investment, the expected goals and outcomes of that type of investment as it relates to improved efficiencies, improved ability to keep people locally for care, supporting a primary care base more effectively, et cetera, et cetera. You know, lots of different ways to think about strategically how facility investment can impact our organizations positively. Um, and then start to get a little bit more tactical in terms of looking at you know, your historical financial performance, the expected impact of that investment, the cost-based reimbursement, et cetera, and understanding what ballpark are you starting in from a debt capacity perspective. As I mentioned, uh, we would strongly encourage that you look at the USDA NRHA Technical Assistance Program uh, to get some help in this particular area. And then, um, you know, really, as you start to get more into the planning of an actual project, make sure that the design teams that you're working with are sizing the projects appropriately, that we're not building extra space at, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars per square foot um, that we shouldn't, you know, that we can't afford. So we need to go through a deliberate process to, you know, plan for the future, for the spaces that we really need and build what we need. But really not try to build more than we need and be as efficient as possible to create the outcomes that we're trying to create for our community. So with that, Hillary, um, we'll open it up for questions here in the last couple of minutes, and then I'll turn it over to Amy Graham for our next presentation. Thanks, Brian. Um, all right, let me, let's give a minute um, for people to ask questions. Um, and if you have a question, you can um, either enter it into the chat um, or into the Q&A section, and um, I will make sure that Brian sees it. Um, all right, here we go. Looks like um, we do have a question. Um, all right, so the first question, Brian, is what are the best practices um, for debt capacity analysis that you recommend for starting? Yeah, thanks, Hillary. Um, the number one thing I would say is get somebody that you know understands what's going on in the marketplace that can support you. Um, you know, as leaders, CEOs, CFOs of critical access hospitals, I know we're expected to do a lot, um, but these technical assistance resources are there for a reason. And um, you know, I kind of walked through the general process, but there's you know nuance there. I think that's a great place to start. You know, pick up the phone call Brock Slava or Tommy Barnhart or let any of us know here at Stroudwater um, if you need contact information to get in touch with them. Um, and then I think the other thing that I would share is, you know, really understanding that we want to evaluate our ability to meet the community's needs to create financial flow as a result of that, you know, the EBITDA component and then compare what that looks like to what the costs of the debt are in the marketplace. Um, we used 4.5% for the cost of capital in our analysis today. I think that's a reasonably solid assumption for 
whatever size or scale of project you may be looking at. And, and then I think the other last thing that I would just share is really engaging the board of directors or sometimes the board designates a building committee once you start to get into the project planning and get everybody on board with, you know, here's the impact of cost-based reimbursement. Here's what we've been able to generate historically. Here's how the numbers actually add up. Um, it is an overwhelming amount of money for most uh, of the trustees, certainly in our rural communities, to consider, you know, 15, 20 million dollars for doing a, a project to um, enhance services. So we want to make sure that we get stakeholders in our community comfortable with what with what we're doing and that we're being responsible with those resources. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, are there any more questions? Um, all right, I'm not seeing more questions. So um, okay. thank you well, very much. I think we can- Absolutely. Well, thank you, Hillary. And I'm very excited to be present or to be introducing my colleague, Amy Graham, who is going to be picking up the ball here um, once I figure out how to stop sharing. There we go. And taking our- um, our next step, and Amy, you're going to be talking about uh, the introduction to chronic care management. Is that right? I, I am, and you know what? I phoned a friend, and I brought Cameron along with me, so Cameron's going to be presenting as well, and he's actually going to be sharing his screen. So every time you said, well, Amy Grant's going to be next, I'm like, no, I'm bringing Cameron too. I'm not going alone. <laughs> So Good thanks stuff. for handing it over. And I just want to say thanks for, help. you know, I really appreciated the fact that half the audience had never done a capital project because every time I listen to Brian talk, I'm like, okay, where do I start? Just where do I go, Brian? So thank you for sharing that. I really appreciated it. So you bet, Amy. All right, Cameron, you there? Yeah, your phone, not, you take your phone off of mute, take, you know, because you got to talk in this too, Cam. <laughs> All right, so um, we are jumping into this. Thanks for handing that over. And we are, are off into the world of care management and uh, talking about chronic care management today. So um, what we're going to do, so Cammie, if you go to the next slide, that's just, I'm Amy Graham. I'm a principal with Stroudwater. We've got Cam here. And the things that we're going to talk about on the next slide are just understanding about a care management program. You know, Brian did a survey and I'm thinking, oh, why didn't I do a survey to find out how many of you on the phone actually, uh, on the phone, on the Zoom call today, actually have a care management program and then understanding what the basic elements of a Medicare chronic care management program are. And then really looking into the financial considerations, like why do we really need to do this? Why is it, Amy, you know, why is she talking to me about this today? Um, and if you've spent any time with me, you know that I'm always wondering, how are you going to get paid? What's that going to do? So I really like it when we have projects out there where we will get paid. So that's a great thing. So with that, um, Cam, I think I'm going to hand it over to you and let you just tell us about the care management program and what that's all about. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Amy. So as Amy said, my name is Cameron Smith. I'm a consultant here with Stroudwater. And really, we're going to focus on, before I turn it over to Amy to go through the reimbursement and financial side of the equation, just what, what is chronic care management and why is it so important? So we know that chronic diseases in America are one of the leading causes of death and disability with about a cost of $3.5 trillion in annual health care costs. Six out of every 10 adults in the U.S. have a chronic disease condition and four in 10 adults in the US have two or more. So when we really start to look at what are these chronic diseases and the prevalence across the US, we can see that based on this data set here from the chronic condition warehouse, that there's really a huge amount of chronic conditions out there that are very prevalent throughout the US, looking specifically, you know, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and many others. So what is chronic care management? It's really a way for us to address the complex needs of these patients and of these patients that have multiple chronic diseases. So in 2014, Medicare started paying for chronic care management services for patients with multiple chronic conditions. So patients with two or more chronic conditions under the physician fee schedule. And it allows healthcare professionals to be reimbursed for the time and care that they put into these patients' health for face-to-face -face appointments. But once again, specifically focusing on patients that have two or more chronic conditions 
who are at significant risk of death or functional decline. And then this can be provided by FQHCs, RHCs, CAS, and can be any face-to-face -face encounter or non-face-to-face -face encounter, which I think leads us to kind of another interesting question that Amy, I'll kind of turn over to you to ask the audience. Amy, did you want to throw oh, that? Okay. So, so with looking at this with chronic care, one of the reasons why this is, going to the next slide, Cam. So one of the reasons why this is so important is that the benefits to the patient is that they get a dedicated team of healthcare professionals who can help them plan for better health and stay on track. So you have that engagement with the patient that the patient might not want to come in, but they're getting support between the visits that they may be experiencing some conditions at home and have that phone call with you. And when they are have that phone call with you, you know, to just have the discussion, they're leaning on you for support. They may have issues that they don't really think are important, but because they've got that conversation with you, they're stepping in and saying, hey, what about this? What's going on? And then the benefit to your practice is that there's an improved care coordination process. So it's building that relationship between you and the, you and the patient. I always know that for me, it's always nice that I can pick up the phone and talk to my provider and, and they know who I am and they know my name and understand my issues so that then when something comes along, it's like, yep, we can take care of that, not a problem. And then it also helps to sustain and grow your practice. Because when these patients come in, they have that trusted relationship with you, and they will come and see you for not just your care management offerings, but for other offerings as well. And then to, what it will do is also provide additional resources to help your practice care for those high-risk, high-needs patients. That way you can practice with both your hospital as well as your clinic or and just have engagement around that patient to where those um, low volume type or not low volume, but they're probably um, low risk issues that patients are working with that you have that relationship with them on a day to day basis. Back to you, Kim. So you know, going a little bit further into what is the impact of chronic care management? When a study in November of 17 published by Mathematica showed that when they looked at Medicare spending from 2014 to 2016, we actually saw for patients that were enrolled in a chronic care management program that per beneficiary per month expenditures decreased by about $74 over that 18 month time period. And this is while Medicare payments to physicians actually increased. So we saw savings and all of, and beneficiary information flow through to our patients with that chronic care management program in the form of savings and less healthcare costs while also seeing kind of a rise <clears throat> in payments to our physicians. So really looking at chronic care management as a way for improving the health of a community and a population and improve our primary care patient base. You know, when we think about kind of that, as Brian mentioned on his previous, uh, in his presentation, we think about Eric Shell and the shaky bridge and this journey towards population health. We think about caring for a community and all of these different care management programs that we need to really move forward on to realize this population-based payment system. We're trying to improve the health and wellness of a community while trying to capture additional revenue and move the payment system as well. And a robust chronic care management system really allows us to do both. And this is something that can be done, like we said, with FQHCs, CAS, RHCs. So what are the basic elements of a chronic care management program? When we look at the practitioners that can be involved in this program as physicians, midwives, any clinical nurse specialists, PAs, it's important to note, though, that only one physician can bill for chronic care management for a patient during a calendar month. So we need to make sure that we have that designated physician who's providing the care to those patients. And then any other non-physician practitioner or limited license practitioner cannot bill for chronic care management. These practitioners can participate in the form of chronic care management, but as clinical staff, not as that practitioner. Amy, I don't know if you have anything to add there. Yeah, I was going to jump in and say on this one physician. So it is a, so once the patient signs up for care management services, they're assigned to a practitioner. So if you have other practitioners who are involved in that, 
they're considered part of the supporting clinical team. And when we get into the financial pages a little later, I'll show you how you can bill for that. So there are actual two separate billing codes for the practitioner who has been assigned to that patient and then other um, other CPT codes that you can use to bill for that clinical side. When you look at who's eligible to receive care under a chronic care management program, eligible, eligible patients are patients that have two or more chronic conditions that are expected to at least last 12 months until the patient passes away or something that places them at significant risk of death, decompensation, or functional decline. A couple of key examples of chronic conditions include, and this is not an exhaustive list, but Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, COPD, hypertension, and others. That, that list is just to name a few. So to identify the patients that are going to participate in this program, we're going to look for Medicare Part B patients that have two or more chronic conditions that are expected to last at least 12 months. We're looking at, we're going to prioritize those patients that are at the highest risk of hospitalization who have recently been seen in the ED. So making sure that we have a robust program to track patients coming through our ED, either their social determinant of health data or other conditional data for a presentation to see what are the key disease, diseases coming into our organization. And we're also going to look at patients that are regularly going to the clinic already to manage symptoms. We're also going to identify patients who may be more, most likely to benefit from having a care manage, manager who has a number of physicians and specialists already providing care to them. So how can we streamline their care process and really bring the care to them? Or who have limited social or family support. These people are already in our clinics. We typically know who they are. And then additionally, we can identify patients who are duly eligible for traditional Medicare and Medicaid, but not managed Medicaid. Yeah, Amy, anything to add on that note? Good to All go. right. So a couple key services that we want to include in our chronic care management program include that we're going to really conduct that initial face-to-face -face visit. We're going to utilize our EHR for specific purposes related to chronic care, and we're going to maintain that in an electronic care plan. So that comprehensive care plan needs to be electronic if we can. And then we're going to make sure that we're really providing access to care and continuity 24-7 for them. And we'll dive into these all a little bit more in depth on the next slides functional care coordination and transition of care, and then also transitional care management. So what does that initial visit look like? Before we can start the chronic care management services, we have to initiate a visit for a new patient or a patient who hasn't been, who the billing practitioner hasn't seen within one year. That's a requirement. This visit can occur during a face-to-face -face evaluation. So an e &M visit, an annual wellness visit, or a, an initial preventative physical exam. One key thing to note is that the practitioner does not discuss chronic care management during one of these visit visits. It does not count as the, init the initiating visit. That's why also, why also documentation is so important during these visits. It is important to note that this face-to-face -face initiating visit isn't part of CCM and it can be billed separately. So Amy, do you want to talk a little bit about the HIC PIC code? I will talk about that in a, in a few pages coming forward. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that one. Yep. Because I've, I've got a whole bunch of them to share with everybody. So it's easier just to do it all at once. That important to know that off. patients must give consent to receive these services. This can be written, verbal, but it must be documented in the medical record. The documentation needs to include the patient's consent to participate in the program, that they're informed that they can stop the program at any time and that only one healthcare professional can provide it, the services in a calendar month, and then any information about cost sharing as well. So once they have this informed consent they, that is there, unless they switch to another provider. And it's so important, and Amy will dive into this a little bit more as well within her section about making sure that we have proper information recorded in the health record. So making sure that we're documenting the time and services that are furnished, and we're recording the patient's demographic, their consent, and their care plan into the EHR. And what does a comprehensive care plan look like? There's also resources available online. Many organizations have made tools that are publicly available to really help with creating a comprehensive care plan. But essentially, we're looking at a person-centered care plan that covers the problem list, what is their expectation moving forward and their treatment goals, and we're making sure that the patient has a copy of that care plan to move forward that goes through things such as planned interventions, environmental evaluations, and then making sure that we're also scheduling requirements for periodic review of that plan. 
It's important to make sure that this plan is also available with any other individuals involved with the patient's care and also with the patient so they have a copy of that care plan to know how to manage their care moving forward. You know, going back to that page, Cam, one of the things that, you know, is really important is to make sure that it's person-centered, you know, that it, it, it focuses on that person, what is their care plan based on their physical, mental, you know, cognitive functions, what what is happening with them, and then really do an assessment or a reassessment of the resources and then support. Because when you think about the patient that we are targeting or that you would be targeting for this process, you're looking at those that have limited resources at home. And so with those limited resources that are at home, you want to make, you know, identify who is that service for it and then really help them in managing that chronic condition. What does that look like? How can they do it? Getting them involved because this is a care that you're doing with the patient having that activity between the two. And then one of the things with having this electronic care plan available, that they've got it there at their fingertips, that they can then go and say, you know, say, here are my medications that we're seeing, and here's my electronic care plan. This is what we're working on. So that they know, and then any caregivers have a copy of that as well. So those are things to just keep in mind when establishing this care plan and the information that's there. We also want to make sure that we provide access and continuity, access to care and continuity for these patients. So making sure that we have an opportunity for them to have 24-7 access to physicians or other qualified practitioners or clinical staff, and that they have a way to engage with these practitioners as they move forward in their care processes. So making sure that we're providing patients and caregivers opportunities to communicate via phone, secure messaging, secure web, email, or through the patient portal is crucial so that they can ask questions and engage with their care when they need it most. It's also important to make sure that we're really coordinating the care around these patients so that we're providing a care coordination between home health and hospice for patients that require it, that we're checking. We're coordinating the care with their outpatient therapies, durable medical equipment, transportation services. Oftentimes, transportation is a huge issue for patients getting in to visit their chronic care management provider and see those services regularly. So making sure that we have methods set up for them to come into the clinic to receive services and making and sure that, go ahead. I was going to say, and one of the things to do about this is to really make sure that this is documented, because when you are billing for this and capturing this information that we're going to talk about in a minute, that all of these visits, this communication, this coordination, as you know, that time adds up, and it's probably activities you're already doing with the patient, but you want to make sure that it's documented in that patient's medical record. Um, that then you have that information available, you can capture all of that time, and through that time being captured, then know to what level of service you're going to bill for. That we're going to talk about in in the coming preview of the pages to come. And transitions of care is incredibly important as well. So making sure that we're managing the transitions of this patient's care between and among healthcare providers. So making sure that we're documenting any referrals to other physicians, that we're following up after an emergency department visit. Are we calling patients that are presented to the ER and went home within 24 to 48 hours to check and see how are they doing? Are they eligible for chronic care management services? And do they need to see their primary care provider? And then also after any patient discharge from the hospital, are we checking in with any SNFs that they've gone to any other nursing homes or long-term care facilities to see if they need a follow-up appointment with their primary care visit, primary care practitioner, or if they're eligible for chronic care management services. Making sure that we have an exchange and shared continuity of care documentation with providers throughout a patient's continuum of care is crucial to managing their chronic conditions as they move forward in this program and essential to their care plan. Now, one key thing to note is beginning in 2020, in calendar year 2020, CMS also introduced the Principal Care Management Service to really look at chronic care management as an opportunity for patients with a single chronic condition or with multiple chronic conditions, but we're going to focus on one single high-risk condition, take diabetes, for example. And this is services that are typically expected to last six months to a year or until the patient's decline, significant decline as well. And these services require 30 minutes before billing. 
And Amy will kind of dive into that a little bit as well as we move into the financial section of the presentation. Yeah, you've been leading up to this the whole time, coming on to the financial considerations. So if we go to the next slide, when looking at the care management, there, there are codes for both the clinical staff time as well as for the professional staff time. So remember when I, we were talking about just a few minutes ago how they sign up for a physician, but what about all these other physicians who may provide services or providers? That all goes into the clinical staff time. And when we were talking about capturing that time related to it, you would use a different code based on which element of time you're using. And you can bill for multiple, multiple units of these codes. So for example, the 99490, that's the first 20 minutes of that clinical staff time. So it says directed by the physician. We'll, sh we'll see their section in just a minute. But it's directed by the physician time. So you're keeping track of that, all of that communication. You're thinking, why do I have to communicate? Well, you know, you can actually get paid for communicating with the other providers and having that coordinated overall view of this care. And so then for each additional 20 minutes of time that you would have, you would bill a unit of a 99439. Now, you know, for in order to bill for these codes, you have multi, you for each of them, it's got to be two or more chronic conditions that you're looking at. The conditions are in, put the patient significant risk, so it's the same risk elements that were listed before, and you have a comprehensive care plan established, implemented, revised, or monitored. So that's how you are looking at it, and you can bill for the first 20 minutes, 99439 for additional minutes. If you have additional, the first 60 minutes, and even more than that, because we all know in your offices or with your patient population, you do have that one patient, you know, the most difficult one that's out there where they are calling you, asking you questions. They're coming into the office to follow up with you. And with that information and working through it, this is the way that you can bill for it. And there are multiple codes to use. Going to the next slide, Cameron, we have the professional side. So with the professional side, you have the 994491. So you see that it's a different code. This is the time that the physician spends. At least 30 minutes of physician time, you would bill for that. If there were an additional 30 minutes, you would bill for the 99437. And then the GO511 is for... Um, the GO511 is for 20 minutes or more at an RHC or FQHC. And I believe, it, does each chronic condition need to be discussed and documented in every encounter build? I'm going to have to follow up on that one because that's a good question. My thinking is that if, when you say each chronic condition need to be discussed, like if they have multiple chronic conditions and they're only calling about one, um, I lean toward that it's okay to only talk about one chronic condition um, in a time to account toward the time, but you do want to make sure that at least within that monthly monthly time span that you are discussing all of the chronic conditions out there. But I'm going to take this as a follow-up question and get back to you on that um, because the way I'm reading your question is, does each chronic condition need to be discussed in every encounter build? The end, now going back to that answer, my answer is yes, in every encounter that is being billed, you need to be discussing each chronic condition that is out there. In counting for that 30 minutes, or if we go back, Cameron, go back to the prior slide, that um, the prior slide with the clinician time, so it, the 99490, I'm going to stop here for just a second and say that 99490 is the first 20 minutes of clinical staff time. You may have a 10-minute phone call today where they're talking about chronic condition of COPD, but then you've got another, you know, five-minute phone call where they're going to talk about a different chronic condition they have, and then you've got another, and it's cumulative throughout the month. 
So it's the amount of time that you are spending in the month. In that monthly time frame, when you bill for that, that you need to include all of your chronic conditions. But in accounting for that 20 minute of 20 minute time period, it could be 10 minutes about the COPD and then five minutes about hypertension and then, you know, a cumulative effect. If I misunderstood your question, please just send me another note and let me know and we'll clarify that a little more. But thanks for asking. It's cumulative for the month and then you bill it once a month for these services. So Cameron, if we go on to the next one. So um, the, so for CCM services, I know we've said this um, before, but it, the, if the billing practitioner doesn't personally furnish them and the clinical staff furnishes them under the direction of that billing practitioner on an instant to basis, then you're billing it for, you will bill for that clinical code, not the uh, practitioner code. So you see like CPT code 99491 is the time that only the billing practitioner spends, whereas you've got all these other multiple codes that the time spent directed by the clinical staff. Um, and then if it's, you know, the clinical staff being other providers that are out there. Now the reimbursement, why are we talking about this? So I'm giving you the national reimbursement. If I were speaking to you directly, I would actually go and pull, if I was speaking to you one-on-one, -on -one, I would go for your locality and find out what the reimbursement is for your area. However, because we're talking to multiple states and multiple localities, and I have watched the numbers fluctuate, we're going to give you the national reimbursement. So when thinking about this, so in looking at this reimbursement, you can see we were talking about a 99491. That's the time that the physician spends. The re national reimbursement average on that is $83.17. And so then you would bill that at least 30 minutes of physician time, and then the clinical staff time throughout the month was another 40 minutes. You would bill for the 99490 and the 99439. So you're going to get roughly $185 around in there. I'm not doing heavy math this morning. I probably should have looked at that. But in looking at it, you do get that payment there. Now, the GO511 is the 20 minutes or more at an RHC. So you do uh, receive a different reimbursement of that $71.68. And then you can see the different amounts there if it's a moderate to high complexity and it's 60 minutes of um, clinical staff time for that moderate to high complexity. And it all goes back to how is this information documented? Making sure that you are documenting that it is a complex account versus not. And then, so we'll go on to the next slide. It actually shares, you know, just in billing for that RHC, we were talking about that, that if they can, that you can bill for multiple services, so the chronic care management as well as the uh, tertiary care management services during the same, for the same patient during the time. And that GO511, it's not factored into the RHC's all-inclusive rate. So there are that, there are um, reimbursement rates that are outside of your all-inclusive rate at the RHC. And then Beginning in January 1st of 2024, they added new, four new buckets of care with your remote uh, phys physiological monitoring, remote therapeutic monitoring, community health integration, and principal illness navigation. Um, new rules applied for that within the RHC where you can bill for multiple GO511s for each patient per month. So, Let's talk about this. I told you you can bill for it, but what is the financial model around this? So we've put some modeling together with year one and year two, and I sort of feel like you, Brian, that I'm stepping up and giving modeling as to financial projections out there. But what we're saying is that if a patient, so we're assuming that in model one, that your Medicare population of patients is 1,170 patients. That's how many you have that are uh, Medicare patients. And we're saying that 10% of those patients 
participate in chronic care. So that's what, 117 patients at $75 a month that we're saying per member per month is an average reimbursement that for 12 months, you have it there in a ramp up of 25% year over year that you start that annual impact for year one is 26,000. But then you increase your Medicare population year over year, and then we're going to say that we're still participating 10% um, of that population. But by year five, we have 100% of that 10%, and it, the math rolls out to be 126,000 and 054, dollars $54. So in thinking about that, this is additional revenue that you are bringing into your practice. And I'm looking at that to see it. And our assumptions that we have over there is that the panel size was just taken by the Medicare total visits, so it's three visits per year, and that the payment per member, that, that $75, that's about the average rate that it's doing. In your model number two, if you can say that you get a 35% participation in your Medicare population that first year, 35% of your 1,100 patients participating in this, then you would have of that that you would have 25% of that 35% doing heavy math here, that your annual impact would be $92,000. And then by year two, it would grow 50% participation for 192,000. And you can see how that ramps up. So there really is a financial benefit here that when you look at you know, could you have a dedicated staff, a staff that really takes this on and says, one, we understand the value that this is bringing to our community, to our patients, and we are going to own this program and run with it. And then offsetting that with the revenue that you are bringing in. This is just an average of, you know, three visits per month at $75 for the revenue for that. So you can see how that would model out. And that uh, the model one, the, the five-year impact is going to be $414,000, whereas in model two, if you could just get a 35% participation by the end of year five, it's a 1.4, almost $1.5 million um, in additional revenue for your practice. And I'll add, this is where we like to recommend, you know, if if you're trying to build this program or if you have this program, are we targeting 30% of that part population, that Medicare population as proactive outreach? Are we doing something like Amy said, do we have a person in place who is calling those patients to say, hey, I notice it's time for you to come in for your appointment. And we're reminding people and actively working with our patient panels to have them going in because the difference between 10% and 35% and shown on this projection is a pretty wide spread. So it's worth it to have somebody in place to really manage, help manage that population. And it, it's, I've, I've talked to um, several practitioners out there that when you find the ones that have a care management program in place. And, and when I talk to them, I'm like, hey, I know your name now. Do you mind if, you know, if somebody calls and they have questions about it and want to understand about, um, you know, well, how do we set this up? What does it look like? That they love to talk about it because of the benefit that it is bringing to their practice. And just the stories I hear about patients who can pick up the phone and go, hey, I've got this going on. And, you know, they would have just, you know, they, they got an ill, they're, they got, you know, a cold and they might have skipped their annual wellness visit, but because they're part of this chronic care management program, they're getting that phone call and they've got that trusted person on the other end of the phone who is taking care of just any, you know, their health and a partner with them. And so, you know, it's just the benefits out there. I'm probably not doing a great job at selling it, but the benefits that are out there, not just financially, but also for your community are just spectacular in the stories that I hear from people. So, so that is back to me. Oh, it's back to you. Good. All right. So when we're looking at the chronic care management program, you know, Amy went over all the financial considerations. We've talked about some of the basics, but it's also critically important to make sure that we're really documenting what we're doing in these programs and making sure that our clinical documentation is complete. It's accurate. 
And the reason for this is because we want to maximize the information for our patients. We want to make sure that we really have that comprehensive care plan and the information that they require to move their care forward. But we also want to maximize the financial benefit as well as Amy kind of alluded to earlier. So making sure that we have, we're documenting everything that we're doing so we can receive all the financial benefits of everything that we're doing with the patients, including the face-to-face -face visits, all the monitoring of care, all the visits with clinical staff. And this also helps really capture the patient's medical status, which includes comorbidities, and it helps improve revenue capture as well. Because if it's not documented, or it's not something that we're likely going to get reimbursed for because it doesn't appear that it occurred. Then a couple of key components of our documentation process is making sure that we really have that consent form clearly laid out and implemented in the EHR. So as you can see here, this is an example of a chronic care management patient consent form where we go through what are CCM services as it, the patient to make sure the patient's really informed on what are the services they're getting, what is their care plan, what's the impact to them financially, and the option, as we discussed earlier, their option to unenroll if they decide they don't want to do this anymore. And then how do they get started? And then you have the opportunity for them to sign, go through their information and print their name to really ensure that we they understand this program before they get into it and the benefits of it. And then provided right here by the healthcare, the Health Quality Innovation Network is just another comprehensive care plan template. So something that we can really utilize to walk through their problem list, any surgeries, tests, procedures, any medication they're on, and go through their entire list of chronic conditions and what they're doing to care for, for those conditions, and something that can easily be put into the EMR, sent with the patient, and sent to other providers to help manage a full transition of care in that wider range of the continuum of care for these patients, as well as their chronic conditions and the goals for those key chronic conditions. So what are the goals for improving those chronic conditions as they move forward with their care plan? Couple key tips for documentation, make, or including to make sure that we have an audit process in place to discuss di decisions regarding care. So we're having somebody who's clinical going in, just verifying that we have everything that we need within the EMR, and that we're truly documenting what we're doing with these patients. We also a key process that we really like to see is if you have the ability to have somebody in clinical documentation integrity training and send them for CDI training or any kind of just coding training to help improve their knowledge of documentation, send those people and make the investment because the revenue cap, the extra revenue capture is shown in the financial models is worth it. And then make sure that everything is available to all members of the care team for the patient and that no documents are getting lost in transition somewhere or that we don't have documents in multiple places, that it's in one singular spot that we can go on our part two for their care as they move forward through the process. And if you have any additional questions on CDI training or what is clinical documentation integrity inside of here, there's a couple extra links as well. So Amy, I will turn it back to you. And you're on mute. I see that. I put myself on mute accidentally. All right, so let's go um, to the next slide, Cameron. There we go. So this is Cam and I. If you have any questions, feel free, you know, after this, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we we'll love to chat with you and share with you um, the, you know, things that we're seeing out there in the marketplace. I reserve the right to say, hey, we become friends. And if you have a successful program out there, share that with us. We love to just help others understand what's going on and the success that people are seeing out there and any questions that they, you know, any questions they may have or just things that they were able to overcome and challenges out there. Um, Hillary, I'm gonna turn it over to you right now and see, do we have any questions out there that people may have sent in in the Q&A? I saw the one come up in the chat box and just answered it right then, but I didn't know if we had any other questions come through. Um. Sure, just a minute, Amy, let me take a look. Um, all right, it looks like we do have a question. Um, so let's start with this one. Um, so this person would like to know if the patient has only one chronic care condition, do you use the same billing codes um, that, that you shared? So, oh, that's a good question. Thank you for asking. 
So with those codes that we shared with you today, that is only for the chronic care condition codes. If you are looking at a primary care condition program, the PCM program, there is a separate set of questions that, uh, a set of questions, set of CPT codes that you use for that process. Happy to connect with you on that and share those with you. Um, but they are different set of codes for the chronic care versus the uh, versus the PC pr primary care or principal care. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Amy. Um, we have another question. Um, can these be done in a non RHC setting? So yes, Kim was sharing that it can be done in the FQHC setting. I should let you answer this one, Kim. It can be done in an FQHC setting as well as an RHC, or it can be done in an outpatient setting. So if you have um, a clinic that is not an RHC, you can do it at that, or you can even set it up within your hospital as an outpatient program, because it is, um, it is an outpatient service that you are providing to those Medicare um, programs. Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. Um... All right, so if anyone has any more questions, please um, type them in right now. Um, but I'm not seeing anything new. Um, so I think that um, if everyone's all set with questions, we can uh, go ahead and- Yep, can, yep we'll okay. share that off. Yeah. So we did include, thanks Hillary for that. We did include some useful links there related to um, there is a, a column, MLN Matters, it's the Medicare Learning Network. They have a, um, are, they have a useful guide on chronic care management, as well as some other project products that are out there. And then on the next slide, we will be distributing these slides to you. There is a physician testimonial. Um, this is on the CMS website, so you can go to CMS, it's Connected Care. So it's a physician testimonial about care management. So uh, feel free to go out to YouTube and look at that. And then our last slide that we have out here is we just thank you for attending today's conference. Um, you know, we just are committed to provide high quality learning events for you all. And so if there's anything that you want to learn from us, we really are uh, interested in sharing that with you. This is our fourth annual Critical Access Hospital Regional Conference. Um, after you sign out of this, there's going to be a survey that pops up just asking for your feedback. So we really like to know, you know, do you want to learn more about this? Are there other areas that you're interested in? And how can we do that to help support you? So um, thanks to everyone for attending today. And I think that's our last slide, isn't it, Cam, in the deck? Yep, that's our last slide. Thanks for attending, Brian. Thank you for sharing, Hillary, for facilitating this discussion today, and for you all for giving us your time because we know that that's very valuable. So with that, we'll sign off and say have a great day and happy Wednesday to you. Bye now. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.